because the humans who became the powerful netheries started as workers for the elves and the elves gave them this little bit of magic to help them do this job and that little bit of magic to help them do that job and then over time they said hey we can do this ourselves we don't need the elves there are few things as captivating as the allure of long lost civilizations and once great empires now in ruins especially if those empires were as magically imbued as netheril was I'm Ivan of Many Realms, and on this episode of Realms Lore, Ed Greenwood and I talk all about the Netherese. Lauded for their adeptness at the art, or their ability to manipulate the magical weave, the Netherese Empire was once a superpower of Toro. What made the Netherese Empire so special? What caused its eventual downfall? And most importantly, how can that help shape our games right now? Get exclusive answers to the Forgotten Realms' most burning questions. Find that on Patreon, link in the description, and become a protector of the realms so you never have to miss out on what the realms has to offer from the mind of its original creator. So think of a ancient human em uh, empire of powerful magic where all sorts of spells, magic items, and mighty artifacts came from. So if you're a dungeon master creating them, and you want to have something lying around that's ancient, that's in the tomb of a king or down a dungeon, it could have come from ancient Netheril. And everybody knows, you know, the, in, the sort of common received folklore is that this empire ultimately fell because of its arrogance and its overreach. They may not know where exactly it was. Um, most people have heard that it had flying cities that floated in the air but flew about so it could end up in different places from where they started or flew about regularly but they don't really know anything much more about it than that it's it's this magical place of long ago when magic was really powerful there you go that's sort of netheril in a in a nutshell so Many people that follow the realms know that Netheril had a relatively strict hierarchy. Can you tell us a little bit about what that hierarchy might have looked like? The general stereotype. There was high Netheril and there was low Netheril. And what that meant was low Netheril was where all uh, Netherese started. They became expert farmers, they became expert foragers, and they became expert at um, harvesting the land. And those people, some of them stayed that way when the Flying Cities started, the people who stayed that way became the Low Netherese, and they became the hewers of wood and drawers of water and farmers for the High Netherese in their Flying Cities. It, it's tempting to view them all as the High Netherese enslaved the Low Netherese, but that's true literally in some cases I mean, for some cities, but not for most of them. And they called themselves Arcanists. When it started, that wasn't a character class. That was what the Netherese called themselves instead of Archwizard. I'm oh, an wow. Arcanist. Okay, so that's where that came from. But yeah, in the old days, it was tempting to think of the powerful Netherese were those who had the gift, and they wandered all over the world, exploring things, and moved their cities where they wanted to be, and the low Netherese stayed down on the ground and grew stuff and harvested stuff and hunted for stuff for the high Netherese. And in some cases, with some cities, that meant a severe class system. But in, in other Netherese cities, it was quite egalitarian. So it's dangerous to generalize. That's that's actually really informative for me because I was wondering how much of the, the terms high Netheril and low Netheril really applied to whether it was just geography or if it was indicative of the class system. And from what I'm hearing, what you're telling me is it's a little bit of both. It's It's kind of... Yeah, but more often than not, it was more the geography than it was the class system, even. It, it really did vary from place to place, and people's attitudes. To me, is the most interesting thing about it, is it gives you a chance to explore all sorts of things. As long as you know that these people, at their height and at their best, are very magically powerful. And that's the cool thing. You can then put together almost anything you want from it, you know. Mm -hmm. So, speaking of magic, uh, the Netherese are known... I guess, as being incredibly magically powerful. I think that that's conception most people have of the Netherese. And I know that at one point, all Netherese were low Netherese. So can you <laughs> tell us a little bit about kind of the history of the art in, in the ancient Netheril Empire and how, they're, how that evolved into their culture? We see it today in Halrua, which is one surviving enclave of the, of the diaspora 
of the scattered Netherese Empire. And the best way to think of Hal Rua is the land where the toasters are magical. You know, it's <laughs> like everything is done with magic, and which is which is unthinkable to place uh, to many people elsewhere in the realms because they have to pay through the nose for anybody to cast anything for them. So the concept of wasting um, magic on something, which isn't, of course, a waste, but uh, from their point of view is, why would you do that when magic costs so much? That's the one way of thinking of ancient Netheril. And of course, the other way of thinking of it is they were experimenting. And Ayulam, who survives to this day, in, albeit in a no longer human form, undead and as an elder brain, created the first flying city, created Mithalars, which are the forerunners of the wards and mantles of today. So that's the the key to understanding Netheril is it's experimental. So it the magic varied from place to place, but there was a lot of it. And there was no way of, over the long run, keeping it secret. If somebody came up with something, whether the, the, the guy who came up with it wanted to share or not, eventually it would get out and everybody in the, in the society would be trying this or using that. So magic was advancing by leaps and bounds. And as a result, magical might starts to have an influence on who rules. Not formally. They're never formally saying, oh, we'll let the magic users rule. No. What it meant was, in practical terms, over time, the guy who could cast the spell had the power to say, nope, we're not going to do that, or yup, I'll let you do that. Uh, I can control the weather, so I can control whether you have crops that fail or not. And then once we have flying cities and so on, you actually have some of them who are out-and-out -out tyrants. And then all of a sudden, you do have a magical empire in which people with magic rule. But it varies from city to city and place to place. Again, it, it's a stereotype, not something you can count on being the same all the way across the empire. And is it accurate to say that the elves were the ones that originally kind of gifted the art to the Netherese? Yeah, pretty much, yes. Um, because the humans who became the powerful Netherese started as workers for the elves, and the elves gave them this little bit of magic to help them do this job and that little bit of magic to help them do that job. And then over time, they said, hey, we can actually do this ourselves. Magic is not something that is elven, but not human. Humans can do it. Hey, wait a minute. Ha ha ha. You know, <laughs> uh, so originally when I started and created Netheril, it was a catch-all term to have cool magic items. They came from ancient Netheril. Oh, okay. What's ancient Netheril? Well, this time <laughs> belong, you know. You know, <laughs> yeah. Long ago, blah, 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 and far away, you know, yeah. Okay, got it, got it, got it. So uh, I'm kind of curious about the, the visual aesthetic of ancient Netheril. If you had to, I guess, describe it briefly, how do you think people could describe the Netherese in a visual way that would help them to, you know, role play that better or help them visualize that more? A lot of them would be uh, tall, slender, and snotty. Um, and uh, a lot of them would uh, have all manner of crazy fashions just because they're always experimenting. So let's try this. I think I look good like this, so let's put that on. What you would not have seen is netheries with lasting visual deformities, skin conditions, stuff like that, because that they would use their magic to fix over time. Just because they didn't want to be in pain or disadvantaged, it wasn't a physical perfection cult or anything like that. It's just that if you can do something about something that you don't like, then you do something about it, and they could. So as fans of the realms know, uh, ancient Netheril is ancient. <laughs> it is no more. And uh, I was hoping you might be able to take us through a little bit of the step-by-step -step as far as the fall of Netheril what caused it, and kind of the uh, the, the ripples that it, it caused throughout Toril. You see, this is the bit that I left as vague as possible. And various designers since have started painting in the details. And I was writing it from the point of view always of, if you're playing your campaign right now. And so the general thing was that the Netherese grew so strong that they challenged the gods themselves. And that was their folly, for the gods cast them down. 
and there was a great spell or bad thing happened. We don't really know the details. And all of the floating cities crashed and everyone died. And that was the end, which of course is not true and is an oversimplification. But that's the sort of story that's come down because it gets wrapped up in a moral less. We start having people say, so don't do what the netheries do. Oh, here we go again. <laughs> you know, all we know is that eventually all these floating cities crashed and some of them can be found to this day. Others, nobody knows what became of this city or that city. But uh, adventurers who wander around exploring can find crashed floating cities if they're not careful. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so do you think that most of the ruins one would come upon in a D&D campaign would be of the high netheries or the low netheries? Oh, uh, it, it depends. The sort of ruins you would find that would be low netheries would be things like dungeons, underground, subterranean, because they were storage cellars for food and they were refuges for when uh, the weather got particularly bad. I'm talking now about somebody's spell spun weather that turns into a horror horrendous gale. Uh, so that would be low netheries, whereas if you find what looks like a crashed city on a mountaintop, that's high netheries, obviously. <laughs> um, and I, I tried to leave it as mysterious as possible so that every dungeon master could do something different with each city. So and I wanted it to give every dungeon master maximum elbow room to do whatever they wanted to do. Right, right. You know, because there's so much liberty there in, in kind of deciding what ancient Netheril is, do you think it would be a fun campaign setting to run a game in? Or do you think it's kind of better left abstracted away as something that informs more recent games and, you know, we're close to 1500 DR at this point? The easy way is to leave it in the, in the past. It's perfectly ideal to use as a campaign setting as long as you realize the sort of things that are going on, and as long as that fits with the sort of role-playing stories you want to tell. For instance, if you choose a time right after the fall, where there's a lot of misinformation racing around as to why cities are crashing, but people are just getting out from under, like they're getting off a city if there are high netheries, or the low netheries are saying, let's move, because the people in that flying city, they know where to find us. Let's just move. Yes, they can find us from the air, but the point is, they're coming back to us to plunder our granaries, to take what they want, the way they've always done. Let's just get out from under. So now they have to meet us on our terms. So then you could do an adventure where you're exploring the unknown world and racing out into the wilderness and it's a world full of monsters that you've been able to largely avoid up until now. Well, suddenly all willy-nilly, you're walking in the woods. It's time to do a Gilligan's Island. <laughs> well, I mean, that, <laughs> Full that's, what makes, that's what makes for great role-playing. When you take people out of their comfort zone and they're going, what is going on? Now, the thing is, you, you want to be not cruel sure. to your player characters who in the real world are real people who probably had a hard day at work. <laughs> they don't come to the gaming table to have some person, some sadist um, of a dungeon master, ruin them and crush their souls. They want adventure. That's what Netheril can be, a, a we really don't know what's going on. And if you want to throw a Tarask at them, this would be the ideal time and place to do it because who knows what's out there once you get out into the trackless jungle. Or you could be running into rising other non-human races, the hobgoblins, for instance, or the gnolls who are seeking their, ch this is our chance. Finally, these humans have screwed up and their powers are on the wane. This is our time, you know, <laughs> and then they rise and then you suddenly realize, hey, we're being hunted for food by something. What do we do now? You know. <laughs> So I guess this is the part of the episode where I ask, do you have secrets of the Netherees that maybe aren't widely known by, by the D&D or Realms community at large? And what do you think is something that you wish everybody knew about Netheril and the ancient Netherese? Oh boy. I was always um, a lot more interested in the people of Netheril than the, um, the devices, the magic items, because... Uh, the devices and magic items and spells, it becomes this giant bucket you can put anything in. <laughs> oh, that's from ancient Netheril. <laughs> da, 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 da. Um, but, but when it comes to the people, let me give you two female Netherese who've been neglected in lore. And it was very interesting as to 
why they were neglected. There was one really powerful Netherese arcanist known as Hammer Drassa. Take the word hammer, change the, the E at the end to an A, and just write D-R-A-T-H-A on the end, Hammer Dratha. And her nickname was She Who Crafts Tyrants. And what she did was magically modify many beholders, creating less than genius, biddable hunting beholders with tentacles as well as eye stalks and custom eye stalk powers for specific tasks, such as guardianship and mining. And of course, one of the reasons I came up with Hammer Dratha was because I was creating in the early days in the pages of Dragon all sorts of beholder lookalikes because in the original monster manual, you see something with um, that's round with lots of eye stalks. It's either a gas bore or a beholder. <laughs> so you fire something at it from long range. If it blows up, you're not caught in the blast because it was long range. If it doesn't blow up, run like hell because it's a beholder. <laughs> um, so to get away from that, metagaming, ruining the role-playing. So Hammer Dratha created, or maybe she created, the Goth, or the Death Kiss slash Bleeder, or the Death Tyrant, or many of the other Beholder lookalikes I created for the game. Maybe she was the one who created them. And then we come to another influential and really important at the time, but forgotten today, Netherese Arcanist, a woman called Sardra, S-A-R-D-R-A, -R -R Sardra, and she's best known for Sardra's sequences, which were chains of spells hung to go off one after another. In other words, you cast the spells, but they don't take effect, because the way in which you're casting them, you're casting them so you can now go and memorize other spells, and the spell just sort of hangs there invisible in midair, roiling, but doesn't do anything until triggered. Now, the weld magic slash overkill effects of spells colliding or multiple spell areas of effect overlapping were the drawbacks that in-game, in-setting, in netheral at a time kept sequences or chain magic from becoming more popular, which explains why when you or I um, think of playing a wizard now, it isn't the first school of magic or the first specialty sure, ca character sure. class that we think of because otherwise it would be having a first level wizard who can um go away for a, a week before you go adventuring and cast all chains of spells and then he says yup i'm ready and then you get into a fight and he unleashes his chain of 20 battle spells <laughs> but he's still only first level boy everybody want to play one of those okay why doesn't somebody play one of those and therefore, I have to come up with a, a reason, a drawback, so I built it into the game. This is the drawback. Wahaha. So there you go. <laughs> Sequences of stuff from Netheril that you may not hitherto have known, but I am now spilling the lore beans, because that's what we do here. We spill lore beans. <laughs> Welcome back, Realms fans, to another edition of Realms Speak, where we tackle a word, phrase, or name of the realms that you might stumble over. So we'll stumble over it for you. This time around, we're going to tackle this. Zentarim, or Zentarim. Either one is correct. Zents are just general, Zentish, and so on. Zentalar are the soldiers, the military. And Zentarim, or Zentarim, are the evil empire, the wizards. A huge debate that erupted at TSR before I got there one year because a certain pair of designers had put in a whole bunch of stuff in a dragon product that was all about how dragons mate and have sex and so on, um, and, and their eggs and so on, which mattered to the game mm -hmm. because in those days, lots of things in game use. 